going to sound like this. So, yeah, hello, everybody. And let's start talking. And I still don't want this image up. This image keeps coming up. I don't want to go back to the black image. So if we could go back, because I'm not ready to talk about bush tits yet. Um, we're going to do the audience participation first. Um, didn't they tell you all there was going to be compulsory audience participation? There, yeah, there is. There is, in fact. And this applies to the Zoomers as well as to the, uh, the rumors. So I have a question for every one of you all. Now, you don't have to shout out the answer. In fact, I don't even want you to shout out the answer, but you really do have to answer this question. So here's the question. It's gonna come way out of the blue, way out of nowhere. What's your favorite bird? Now, you can't say oh, the next one, or I love all the birds or whatever I saw yesterday. I really want you to think about your favorite bird. Now I get, get it, some of us, um, don't necessarily have a favorite bird. Um, my dad, who may be one of the Zoomers for all I know out there. Um, oh, oops, something terrible happened. Oh, well, just pay no attention to the screen. We'll, we'll get this figured out as we go along here. Um, he uh, saw that I was gonna be talking about a bird called the bush tit. He doesn't live near where there are bush tits. He said, I thought the American Robin was your favorite bird. And he's right. The American Robin has been my favorite bird. But my point is just pick a favorite bird. So do that right now. And I'm serious, especially for you all in the room. I want you to actually write it down on a sheet of paper or, uh, or take out your phone. I know you guys all have phones and tap in the name of your favorite bird. Don't overthink this. You have no idea where I'm going with this, but I'm gonna give you five seconds to jot down the name of your favorite bird. So one Mississippi, two Mississippi. I know I'm so annoying. Three Mississippi, four Mississippi, five Mississippi. Okay, so you've written down the name of your favorite bird. All right, I have another question for you. And then this, that'll be the end of the compulsory audience participation. Now, I have a specific question here. So don't write anything down until you get the question. I want you to write down three adjectives that describe the bird. Now, not its physical characteristics like long tailed or short crested or brownish or yellowish, but like something about the bird, the essence of the bird, the quality of the bird, the uh, the je ne sais quoi of the bird, something about the bird that is attractive to you or noteworthy or compelling. So three adjectives that describe why, what the, not why you like this bird, but just that describe this bird. And again, not yellow, brown, long-tailed, short-crested, but well, I don't want to leave the audience here, but three adjectives that describe the bird. I'm going to give you 10 seconds to do that. And I'm not going to count, but it'll be about, oh, there's a clock back there. I'll watch that little secondhand thing go there. All right. Now, you all don't look at that. Just, just write your birds, your adjectives down. Got about five seconds. I'm not sure that clock's working. Well, it feels like it's been about 10 seconds. All right. So um, just hang on to that, but also put it out of mind because we want to talk about bush tits and other things like that for now. But this little exercise that we've just done together is going to come back to, to haunt, not well, to haunt us, to, uh, to delight us at the, at the very, very end. Oh, by the way, uh, the Zoomers, you were supposed to have done that as well. So you've got all the time in the world and you can have to go to the bath bathroom or something like that. But the question is again, favorite bird and three adjectival descriptors of that bird. All right, well now, I'm sorry, I know this has been, I've been such a teaser. Now we can actually finally start the presentation. So if you wanna do the first slide, please. We're gonna get underway with some musings on what is objectively speaking, the greatest bird in the world, which is in other words, my favorite bird uh, in the world, the American bush tit or just the, the bush tit. Um, and it is a bird that I have gotten to uh, know and love and to really spend an inordinate amount of time with, um, especially sort of during the past 15 years, but also in some ways the past 30 years. Um, if we could move on to the next slide, please. We're, and we're, sorry, this is gonna go a little bit faster for a bit, but I'll just give you the, uh, the next slide nudge here. We're gonna first of all ponder the matter of um, what this bird's name is all about. Yeah, I, I love bird names. I know that there's a lot of um, discussion in the air about bird names these days. And I'm quite aligned with some of the ideas about changing the names of birds, but knowing about the names of birds is something I'm all about. And let's start off with this name, you know, bush tip. Okay, so you have to be a bird watcher, like all of you people, like not to be sort of be like sniggering or looking at your shoes if you see that name. It reminds me of a time that I was well, actually pointing my camera into somebody's yard in Lafayette and they asked me what I was looking at and I explained that I'm taking pictures of your bush tit. That didn't sound right at all, did it? It's a pretty funny name, actually. And it's a real misnomer as well. 
When I was in graduate school, I learned that there's no such thing as a bush. We say shrubs. Bush is apparently like a botanically incorrect term. Uh, as to tit, well, that's a reference to a kind of bird that this bird is not. So the bush part is wrong. The tit part is wrong. And it's a funny sounding name to begin with. And I sort of dug myself into enough of a hole here. If we could actually go ahead here. Oh, no, not that far, though. We back up. Oh. What? No, we're going the wrong way. There we go. Okay, just wanted to point out that this bird uh, goes by multiple names. Um, and this is confusing, but I will point out that um, a bird in internet, uh, sorry, a name in international usage is the American bush tit, which is a good name because there are actually about 10 species, 10, 12, I'm not sure. There are more than one species of bush tit in the world. And there's just something so wonderfully American, US ish, isn't there, about just saying it is the bush tit. There are actually multiple bush tits. So we're going to refer to this one. Uh, it's, no, not, not yet, not yet, not yet. Uh, sorry. <laughs> As the American bush tit here. Got a very uh, trigger happy uh, projectionist here, but we're, it's all good. We're, we're all friends here. So, this is the American bush tit. I will say bush tit. I will say American bush tit. And a little bit later on, I'm going to say the name of uh, some other uh, bush tit monikers as well. But now, if we can move on to the next entry, we're going to uh, take a look at this bird's scientific name. The scientific name is Salter Paris minimus. And if we can look at the next version here, oh, that went the wrong way too. There we go. We're going to look at all three parts of its names. So many, although not all birds, have three parts of their name, a genus, a species, and a subspecies. And the subspecies that we have in Colorado, so we're going to work backwards here from the subspecies to the species to the genus, is the plumbius subspecies of the bush tit. Plumbius is a word that, again, like birders, you just, we just know what that word means, but no one else on earth does. It's actually related to the word plumber because plumbers work with lead and the color plumbius is leaden. So the interior subspecies of the bush tit is Salter Paris minimus plumbius, which means that it is the lead colored of the two bush tits. Another, well, um, two or more bush tits. There's another one that's not quite as lead colored, so it doesn't have that name, but ours is Salter Paris minimus plumbius. If we could do a gentle tap to the next image, Thank you. I want to point out too that um, names of birds are so often conflicted and contrary, and you have these multiple authorities. Another older name, not in use anymore, but I like it, is sociabilis. And you can sort of imagine what this is all about. It's social. The bush tit is a social bird. Now that is a uh, an unofficial sort of uh, name out of you know use right now. But sociabilis or plumbius are names given to the Colorado and also. Great Basin and Interior West uh, subspecies of the bush tit. Okay, so we've looked at Plumbius, we've looked at Sociabilis. Minimus, as you can probably imagine, means small, minute, minimal. The bush tit is actually the smallest passerine in North America, north of Mexico. Uh, there are a few hummingbirds, although not all of them, that are smaller than the bush tit, but the American bush tit is smaller than the golden crowned kinglet, which I always think of as this incredibly tiny bird, and the American bush tit actually weighs less on average than the golden crowned kinglet, which is an awfully tiny bird. And then we come to this wackadoodle named Sultra Paris. So P-S-A-L, like if we forget all the Trapara stuff, like I'm going to, word association, P, we're in a church, P-S-A-L, Psalm. Okay, yeah. So, um, Salter par oh, Paris, by the way, means tit or chickadee. Salter means, well, let's take a look at the next um, slide, please. This is an entry from um, Grusin's old, old, old bird names book from, I think, like 1972, 1973. It's 50 years old. And I'm going to go doing some editorializing on you here. It seems like every six months, a new bird name book comes out. This is still the best one. It's like 50 years old, and you don't need any of the more recent ones. This is it. But... Grusin wasn't perfect. Uh, he was a very um, uh, East Coast establishment sort. He got some of his uh, Western birds mixed up. Um, and if we could advance here, he said that to suggest that the species sounds like a lute playing titmouse is absurd. But that is what Sultra Paris means. That is, in fact, what Sultra Paris means. It is a lute playing titmouse. For those of you like me who can't really even hear bush tits much anymore, that does seem like a strange thing to say. But what we're going to do now, not quite yet, but um, oh, just a moment. Here. No, no, back, back the other way. What we're doing just a moment here is take a look at my um, an entry in my field notebook for my very, very first encounter ever with a bush tit. And I guess this is a comment here for um, anybody who's under the age of 30. 
uh, because um, the next image is actually from more than 30 years ago. And if we could take a look at that now, please. Thank you very much. Uh, this is um, page 106 from my field notebook from the year 1991. Um, and if we could advance now, we saw that back in the day we uh, had birds called rufous-sided towhees. Claire and Hannah are like, what the heck is that? The rest of you all probably remember rufous-sided towhees. And I was um, taken by the decidedly non-Eastern rufous-sided towhees singing their peculiar songs. Next slide, please. Um, back in the day, we just said scrub jay, all this wood houses and whatever else they are. We just call them all scrub jays here. But next slide, please. A band of musical bush tits. So I heard those bush tits and I thought they were musical and I was enchanted by them. So yes, Groose and bush tits do to at least some people's ears sound musical. Um, I don't remember what my next slide is, but let's advance to it anyhow and take a look. Oh uh, yes, very good. We're actually now gonna be in sort of the biology part of the bush tit presentation here. Okay, so we got what's in the name out of the way. Now we're gonna talk about the biology of bush tits. First, extremely briefly, like in 45 seconds, the general biology of the bush tit, and then we're going to deal with the bush tits in Boulder County. So this is an image from um, classic bush tit habitat in Colorado. By classic, I mean the, what the bird books say. This is a, a pinyon forest in south central Colorado, and this is the bush. This is shrubbery. These are low stature pinyon pines, the sorts of places where bush tits are supposed to occur. But the story of the bush tit we're going to see in a moment, please. Thank you is this story. This is an image from a few hours ago. This is the intersection of a South Fork and Salina in Lafayette. And the really, really exciting part of the bush tit story is playing out in places like this, as we shall see. I think that my next image, but we don't have to do it quite yet. My next image is gonna be the beginning of a sequence of slides. I think there are at least 12 of them that um, just sort of uh, on an anecdote by anecdote, story by story, case by case basis, tell the story of all the cool things that bush tits are doing. So these are just chosen because I think they're kind of cool and interesting, but I hope that they do sort of um, weave together into a, a bigger narrative. So if I'm right, the next slide will be very good. Cool idea number one. So we're going to go through a whole bunch of these cool ideas. They're here. There are bush tits in Boulder County. Uh, that has not always been the case. When I got to um, Boulder County in 2002, 23 years ago, almost 23 years ago, um, I remember I right away got involved with the Boulder Christmas bird count. Who remembers who the compiler of the Boulder Christmas bird count was in 2002? Bill. It was Bill Kempfer, right? I know for the, the, the younger set, like you think that the Christmas count was founded by Bill Schmoker or something like that. But Bill Kemper actually was the compiler. And I told him that I had found a flock of bush tits in the foothills. And he was like really excited about that. And this was the following is so Kemper. He said, just immediately, that's he said, oh, we've had that on exactly eight of the past 64 Christmas bird counts for exactly 0.125 times of the past. And I mean, he knew that kind of stuff. And I remember Bill saying, the choice bird. Don't blow it. Well, I blew it. We didn't find the bush tit. Nobody found a bush tit that year. And um, 20 years ago, the bush tit was a good bird on the Boulder Christmas bird count, about one every eight years. That's how rare the Boulder uh, the, um, the bush tit was on the Boulder Christmas bird count in, in very good habitat, like in the foothills where they're supposed to occur. I moved out to uh, Lafayette um, right before Andrew, who uh, sends his regards, by the way, but cannot be here this evening. He has a, a big project due tomorrow, right before he was born. So um, a little bit more than 16 years ago. And we had no bush tits at all in Eastern Boulder County for my first several years out um, at, in Lafayette and Eastern Boulder County, you know, bird watching every single day. There just weren't bush tits, but they started to show up around 2005. And now of course we see them everywhere. The bush tit is a common bird in Eastern Boulder County and also all across the uh, sort of I-25 metro area. So if you're from uh, Denver, for example, or Fort Collins, you know the bush tit as well. So there are bush tits here, and that is a new thing. For folks who were birding 20 years ago, you, whether or not you remember it, I assure you, you if you were in Boulder County, you were in a time of few, if any, bush tits. Cool idea number one. Number two, um, well, not only are they here, they are breeding. They are breeding in um, in, um, in abundance. Uh, we ha have here sort of three different um, ways of visualizing the breeding experience. Can't see it too well, but in the upper left there, that's the uh, the nest of a bush tit. And 
you know, bush tits are tiny. We've already established they're like the size of a hummingbird. They make these monstrous nests. They look like a dirty tube socks uh, hanging from a tree. Remember any of you all, sorry, this is so nerdy, but the, what was the, the, the cobra mite maneuver in Star Trek? Remember the, uh, that really little, um, he looked like a really, he was a really little alien. He had this like huge ship. I kind of think of bush tits that way. Like they're really, really small and they have huge nests. Um, in the middle here, we have a, um, a bush tit carrying food and and Hannah showed us the picture of the, uh, the puffin carrying fish. Just out of curiosity, I sent this image to uh, David Leatherman um, a little while ago because I couldn't recognize either of the insects. I'm like, they're both really rare. And I don't remember what they are anymore, sorry. But like, that's a bush tit carrying like rare insects uh, back to her nest. And then on the bottom, there is a, a juvenile, a, a, a barely fledged uh, a bush tit down there. So the bush tits not only are in Eastern Boulder County, they are breeding in Eastern Boulder County. Oh, and also let me just be clear. Boulder County, Eastern Boulder County, Lafayette Greenlee Wildlife Preserve. That's how specific this is. My observations, unless I say otherwise, are going to be pretty much from Greenlee Wildlife Preserve in Lafayette. And again, for the Zoomers out there, this is in eastern Boulder County, um, just northwest of Denver a little bit. So cool idea number two, they are breeding. And that's not an idea, that's a fact. If we could look at number three, please. Uh, they are increasing in number. There are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, bush tits, at least in this image. Uh, every year there are more bush tits in Eastern Boulder County. Not only are they increasing in number, uh, they are expanding. Uh, bush tits have now made it up all the way to Casper, Wyoming, which is like practically in Canada somewhere. Um, and they're moving well east of Denver now, like they're seeing them out in Aurora and places like this. And again, this is a bird that just 20 or 25 years ago barely made it north of the Palmer Divide. In other words, you know, Colorado Springs, Pueblo, Walsenburg, places like that. They're here, they're increasing, they're expanding, and there's no end in sight to the expansion of bush tits. Cool idea number four, please. Why are they expanding? Well, uh, they are bellwethers of climate change, or so it is conjectured. Everything about the northward movement of the bush tit is consistent with predictions about the warming and the drying of the climate and the effects it will have on birds. Uh, Jeff Price, whom some of you all may remember from well, quite some time ago, uh, made predictions about birds moving north. And one of his predictions, again, like 20 or 25 years ago, was that we were going to get bush tits. So Jeff, if you're out there, wherever you are, it, it came true. We have bush tits uh, in, um, in Colorado. Uh, the bush tit here is in a, uh, uh, it's a two-leafed, uh, two um, or, or, sorry, two-needled pinion pine. And the pinions in particular, which are slowly moving north, not only in Colorado, but like everywhere, um, are... Um, particularly favored by bush tits. There, uh, I think you can actually see it. There's some uh, little, sorry, arthropods of some sort, uh, aphids, I'll guess. I don't know, but yeah, there, there are lots of arthropods on that. There are lots and lots, there's, there's food on pinions. Bush tits are really, really adept at getting food from pinions. So as the climate gets warmer and drier, it's consistent with conditions favorable for bush tits, but there are actually two other really cool things going on here. So cool idea number five is that they adapt well to new environments, whether or not it's warm or in this case, cold. Another image from just a few hours ago here. So if we take a look at the new environments here, you know, I'm seeing a planted um, a blue spruce back there. And I don't know what all that stuff is at the end of the road there, but it's, it's like, you know, grasses from Africa or something like that. It's like totally planted here. And there's just so much novel, non-indigenous, ornamental, exotic vegetation. But um, what bush tits also do, next slide, please, is, um, they go for any sort of environment. So this is a female bush tit that was um, picking bugs off of the um, that thing that like keeps water off the car. So that's a car, by the way. I don't know if you can, you know, that's the antenna and so forth. Uh, so bush tits find food wherever they can, including on cars. And the cars are really good because it's warm and you know insects can survive in there and stuff like that. So this particular bush tit was um, adapting well to a car and finding plenty to eat on a car. Uh, cool idea number six, please. Yeah, okay. So this one is just extraordinary to me. I think a few of you have probably heard uh, my son, Andrew Floyd, talk about this, but um, uh, bush tits are suet piranhas. And now how, many of you, how many of you are all aware of that? You, 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 okay, now, a tricky a trick question for you all. I want you to um, uh, channel your former selves. 20, some, most of you were alive 20 years ago. Yeah, I mean, not a couple of you, but okay. So, so now I'm asking you a question 20 years ago. Did you know bush tits eat suet? No, no they don't at all. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. Yeah, and um, next slide. Uh, so this is an entry from the Sibley Guide to Birds, which states emphatically they are not attracted to bird feeders. 
Now, um, I, this is like the greatest field guide ever published. And I talked to the author, um, to, to, to David, about this. And he said, yeah, yeah, when I was doing the research for this book, they didn't come to feeders. And he's absolutely right. Bush tits did not come to feeders until quite recently. A couple of years ago, Andrew and I looked into um, the emergence of this novel behavior. It's, it's what we call a meme. He came up with a great turn of phrase. I'm going to get this wrong, but he called it like a, a Facebook media. Wait, how do you put it? No. Culturally coupled. No, that's not it either. Something coupled culturally Facebook mediated cultural co-evolution. That was, that was it. Um, but it, the point is that we started feeding bush tits and bush tits like figured this out and they come to our feeders and we put up more feeders because we like bush tits and there's like this total like cycle of dependency going on here. And we were able to figure out that the first bush tits based on photos, there are like tens of thousands of photos of bush tits at feeders on the web started somewhere around Greeley, just southeast of Greeley, a little bit, you know, sort of closer to the front range. And that this behavior has been spreading um, all across the West. As of a few years ago, we know that it had gotten up to a Western Washington state and to Western Nevada and hadn't yet uh, jumped the Sierra Cascade um, uh, access, but now they're reporting it in uh, the Bay Area and, and elsewhere. So this behavior started in Colorado only 15 or 16 years ago. This is evolution. It's not genetic evolution. It's cultural evolution. It's co-evolution. Humans and bush tits are doing this together. And that, that social media part of it is, um, I, I really think that's part of it. We love posting pictures of bush tits. If you Google like pictures of bush tits at feeders, like you'll break the internet. There's so many pictures of them. And there are like no images of bush tits at feeders until about the year 2005. So some enterprising bush tits, probably part of this colonizing population, you know, because they're already like adventurers, they're pioneers, they want to discover new stuff. They're like, mm, so we'll try that stuff. That tastes pretty good. And bush tits being incredibly sociable, transmitted that knowledge to other bush tits. And we humans, because we adore bush tits, just put out more and more suet feeders. You know, it's funny, um, <laughs> Hannah and I are doing this, well, Hannah's doing, I'm paying for uh, this, this school project that um, involves suet feeders. And if you ever go to, um, the aisle way back on the far wall of the Walmart and Lafayette where all the bird feeders are. I love how it's like red-bellied woodpecker, you know, uh, Eastern bluebird, ruffed grouse, uh, Northern cardinal, probably a black guillemot for all I know. It's like all East Coast birds. And like, and like birds don't come to suet feeders in Colorado, but they come to, but, but bush tits do. It's like they should just put pictures of bush tits on every single <laughs> object at Walmart because that would be actually fair and accurate honest advertising. All right, um, enough about bush tits at feeders. Can we move on to whatever number we're at now? Number seven. Yeah, so this is another tricky one. Uh, this is like a um, historically significant photograph. <laughs> it's by me. Um, this was before I actually owned a camera, but um, this is actually a photo of a bush tit that I took with my scope. Now, how often do you get a bush tit in a scope? But check out the story. So there was a bush tit vocalizing across the way from our house in Lafayette. And it was just like standing on this twig, just giving us and it kept doing it. I thought, I really want to get a picture of this. So I went back in to try to find my scope and tripod. And this was back in the day when you and especially your brother like used my scope for like a gun or something like that. So like I had to figure out where it was and then I had to find the tripod. And like five minutes later, the bush tit was still up there singing or sorry, still up there vocalizing. We're gonna get that in a moment. And this was like really shocking to me because according to the literature, bush tits don't sing. Bush tits along with cedar waxwings are like this passerine species that doesn't sing, according to the literature. This bush tit was totally singing. This is a male, I haven't told you yet how I know that, but um, uh, yeah, this is a male picture of that, um, singing. And there was another one counter singing across the way. Now you could sort of get kind of fussy and say, well, how do you know it was really singing? And I'm gonna go sort of like almost like um, ontological on you here, because it was singing. It was going brrr, and another bird was going brrr, and you know, the chickadees, and then, I mean, that's counter singing. And these bush tits were counter singing, even though bush tits aren't supposed to sing. Now, a couple of things here. I have been just compulsively documenting bush tit song for close to 10 years now. It's always the males, although the question of what is a male bush tit is going to be a tricky one, as we're going to see in just a moment here. Um, and it's birds doing this vocalization starting right around now, late January, March, February into April. Now, they'll sometimes give it at any time of the year, but that's okay. You know, red winged blackbirds sing all year round. And even when they're like in flocks and feedlots, you'll hear, still hear that. You know, they sing their genius name, Agilius. That's the song of the red winged blackbird. And they'll do that all year round. So, are bush tits evolving song, or first of all, are they even singing? 
you know, they're like 84 different definitions of bird song. Like they meet my definition of bird song. But what's much more intriguing to me is the possibility that this is novel, that this is something they didn't used to do. They've had this vocalization forever, that brr, brr, vocal. It's like a little dingling. It's like a, it's a, in case you're curious, it's about 6,800 hertz is the uh, carrier frequency. It sounds like a little telephone uh, going off. I can still sort of hear it. Um, it's loud. For, it's actually very, very, very loud. Um, so I conjecture that the old literature isn't necessarily wrong. I think that the bush tits um, have always made this vocalization and that these bush tits that are rapidly colonizing, encountering new environments, doing brand new things, uh, are singing. And um, this bush tit, um, this male here with its you know, beak sort of open there, was just perched up there uh, all morning long, if you will, singing. Um, that brr, brr vocalization is sometimes described as a um, vocalization that's used to, um, to uh, find a flock if, if the bird is lost. These birds totally knew where they were. They were just throwing songs back and forth at each other. So possibly bush tits have sung and are possibly bush tits are singing and possibly this is a, rat, a newly evolved trait in bush tits. Next slide, please. All right, I talked to you about the problem of gender in bush tits. So on this image here, we see two bush tits. The one in the foreground has uh, those yellow eyes and the one in the background has dark eyes. So the idea is that the only way, the only way at all that you can tell a bush tit apart in the field, so I'm not talking about, you know, looking underneath it or something like that, is by eye color. So uh, males, the bird in the back there, have these uh, very gentle, soulful, sort of staring black eyes. And then females have this uh, very sort of fierce yellow eye. That's absolutely the way sex differentiation in the field has been described for the bush tit forever. And I've really started to come to sort of question whether that's correct. I'll, uh, PG audience here and everything like that. So I'm not going to get into too many deep. Well, I've gotten into the end. But anyhow, the point is, I've seen male bush tits acting like females and female bush tits acting like males, and they're all doing whatever they want to do. I'm just not convinced that the yellow and the black thing works out the way that um, it is supposed to work out. And um, uh, Jeff Stevenson, I know several of us were talking about him at dinner at the uh, Denver Museum, and I um, have been, um, it's on the back burner now, but sort of hatching a plan to actually take a look at. Um, uh, sex and possibly gender. You know, sex and gender aren't the same thing, um, but the, the, the sex and gender differentiation in bush tits and whether the eye color thing is as simple as yellows corresponding to what we humans call females and black corresponding to males. It's something that requires further study. Uh, next slide, please. Cool idea number nine. All right. That's a fairly fancy little sentence there. The retrix molt is aberrant. So the retrices of any bird are its tail feathers, and in particular, the, the feathers that are used in flight. So any bird, that, actually every bird has retrices, and birds that fly use them very, very importantly. So <laughs> bush tits are losing and gaining feathers all year round. At any time of the year, if you see a flock of bush tits, like their feathers don't make any sense at all. And the, 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 actually, the folks on Zoom may be able to see it better than the folks in the room here. But these are bush tits at various times of the year. You can see some sort of wintry and some summer scenes here. And they're always dropping feathers and always growing in new feathers. And they're not supposed to do it that way. Birds like bush tits, which supposedly have only one molt, are supposed to molt like in August, uh, yeah, August September, October. But bush tits, and that may, by the way, that may very well be the true of uh, their head feathers and body feathers and wing feathers, but they are losing and gaining tail feathers constantly. There's just no such thing as a regular annual progression of the losing and gaining of feathers in the tail of a bush tit. Um, I, I said aberrant. What, what it really is, is uh, adventitious. You know, like uh, plants have like adventitious roots. So you know, just um, occasional as needed. I think they just grow and lose feathers whenever they need to. It makes all the sense in the world. Um, Bush tits are always moving around. They're incredibly active. They're always bashing their way through the shrub. Their feathers are constantly breaking off. And I think that they just grow and lose feathers sort of whenever they want to. So um, unlike most other birds that have this pretty regular annual um, progression of the uh, loss and acquisition of, acquisition of feathers, bush tits do it whenever they darn want to. Cool idea number 10, please. All righty. Well, this one, I think uh, for the listeners in the room, they. Uh, sort of uh, get a few folks interested. Um, could there be two species of uh, bush tits in East Boulder? So um, up on the upper, okay, so by the way, something, all these bush tits should look really different from any bush tit that you've seen so far. These are all from um, Green Leaf Preserve. These are all from last year. And these are all birds that are described as the black-eared bush tit, Salter Paris 
now Minimus melanotus, but it used to be Salterparis melanotus, the black-eared bush tit, um, basically the Mexican bush tit, a bush tit that, as you can see here, uh, has these strikingly black ear patches. Now, the bird on the upper left, a photo by Hannah from, I think, August or September of this year, is a bird that, based on eye color, is probably a, um, well, we're not, it, it could be a male. It's also a very fuzzy little bird, and I think this was a young bird. So we're not really sure what eyes even look like in young bush tits. They're probably um, mostly dark male-like. Um, and this is probably a young male bush tit. And for several years, I was thinking also people who try to rein in my uh, conjectural and speculative tendencies that, well, this is just something that young male bush tits show. They're black-eared and they sort of just gradually become normal, uh, more minimist, um, a plumbius like as they grow older. And that's fine, except for these other bush tits here. So the image on the upper right there by Dan Vickers, who was visiting, um, with Patrick Maurice from Georgia earlier this summer uh, is, is fascinating to me. It has yellow eyes. This is an adult female bush tit with strikingly black eyes. You probably can't see it there, but those, those eyes are yellow. And I know the Zoomers can probably see that better than the, uh, the rumors here. Um, and a photo by me of another bush tit. You can see the yellow eye pretty well there. And then a very sharp photo by uh, Adriana Nelson, who was here in Colorado with us for a few months uh, last year. Uh, these are all female, adult female bush tits with pale eyes. And the idea is that like only melanotis can show that. Now, currently melanotis is considered not to be its own species. It's a distinctive Mexican subspecies of the, um, of the minimus or interior bush tit. And birds that perfectly match the phenotype of adult female black-eared bush tits were like showing up right, left, and center. In fact, right, left, center, right, center, right. And lots of bush tits um, matching this um, melanotis phenotype like a thousand, well, like 750 miles north of where they normally occur. And I think that's like really, really cool. Um, you know, the way things are going with uh, zoology and biology and ornithology in particular, you know, they're splitting everything. So yeah, wait a few years and it may turn out that there are two species of bush tits in East Boulder. And um, by the way, I don't really care if there's one or two or 10 species. I just think it's really, really, really cool that this Mexican phenotype is showing up and that at least based on our experiences from August and July and September, you know, actually, um, Dan was out here with us in June or July, or that's even earlier in the season here. Uh, so um, we've got these melanotis black-eared bush tits, and especially interesting are these adult females um, as well. So are there two species of bush tits in East Boulder? All right, next slide, please. Now this should um, raise a few eyebrows. Um, that's not a bush tit. If you think that's a bush tit, you, uh, you missed the memo somewhere along the way. Yeah, so this is, what time is it now, by the way? I just, I'm curious about something. All right, this is like so perfect. This eight, eight's good enough. I, I look at that, it's 8.25. Like I took this image at 8.25 PM yesterday. Like we could go on my, so this image is 24 hours or old. That's a, a great horned owl. I was just out walking, thinking about bush tits or whatever else I think about. And um, so there's a great horned owl. Yeah, this is still the bush tit talk, by the way. But yeah, that's a great horned owl on a basketball hoop by the pickleball courts uh, along the edge of Wanaka Lake right there in Lafayette. Where am I going with all this? Well, where I'm going with is like why bush tits are just unbelievably incredible. I hope you think bush tits are cool already, but now we're gonna talk about why bush tits are really cool. Bush tits are cool for the same reason that owls are cool. I think every single one of us, even like non-birders, like every one of us like has this moment when we realize that like owls are like real birds because owls are so amazing and mysterious and nocturnal and secretive. And like when you realize that there are owls around your neighborhood, especially if you live in a big city. So I grew up in a big city and you know, I remember, I mean, I knew everyone knows an owls. You like, grow up knowing an owl, like, oh my gosh, there are owls out there. There are actually owls out there. That's just so cool to me. And, and the great horned owl, I mean, it's the best owl. You know, I know great, uh, great Claire, great gray owl, but yeah, this bird weighs a lot more than a great gray owl. The great horned owl is just, an incredibly powerful, heavy bird. It's just so cool to realize that they perch on basketball hoops in the eight o'clock hour, right, in Lafayette. And going to the bush tit now, it's the same deal with the bush tit, but much, much more so. Like, just to realize they're owls is cool, but like bush tits, they're actually bush tits here. And that's so amazingly cool. And I think that for us as birders, and this happens to like every single day, every time we're out in the, but birders are naturalists, like to realize that they're really, really, really cool things in our midst. I think it's likely that every single human being in Lafayette sees and hears bush tits. 
but they don't know what they are because they're just like these little birds here. And like, they do all these amazing things I've talked about. They're coming from Mexico and they're breeding and who knows what gender they are and yellow eyes and black eyes and their evolving song and all that other amazing stuff. And like, we're in the know and that's really, 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 really cool. And um, as we sort of start, start to wind down, now we're gonna move to the next slide and look at two more cool things about bush tits. Next slide, please. We're gonna have to keep, aha, cool idea number 11. Bush tits always teach us new stuff. I feel that way about owls, just going outside. I love listening to owls and hearing the sounds they make. Um, just last night, um, I was able to hear, um, it's gonna sound so weird, I was able to hear an owl molting. Like, what does that even mean? So owls have perfectly silent flight, except when they're uh, losing their feathers, and then their flight becomes unmuffled. And I could actually hear that, that great horned owl, it eventually flies like too close to it. I could actually hear the wing beats. And that's probably because um, its wing feathers weren't perfectly smoothed out the way they usually are. It's probably losing a few feathers. Um, some birds like uh, turkey vultures, uh, when they're molting, flap much more uh, noisily uh, than when they are not molting. And um, anyway, but back, back to bushes here. They always teach us cool new stuff. So this image is from this afternoon. We are completely caught up to the present time. This is a bush tit here. It's a, what sex is this or gender? Female, right? She's got a yellow eye here. So we talk about like, every part of the bush tit's body, the tail and the wings and the head and the eyes and the, everything else. What's one part of the bush we have not talked about yet tonight? The feet. Next slide, please. And this bush tit has a band on her leg. I have never, ever seen a bush tit with a band on its leg. I have no idea where this came from. Like, I'm not aware that Scott Taylor or Rekha Saffron, next month's speaker, or anybody like that, or anybody that, like that is banding bush tits in the area. Like, people don't band bush tits. Wait, is that, a, somebody knows? You think they're, they're being banded? Oh, well, there we go, right, super. Well, we found one of his birds then. So how about that? Um, and actually I, I had several images of this bird and you can't really tell from here, but we, um, I got the, uh, the image from different angles. So we can actually reconstruct this band and I'll do that tonight or tomorrow and figure out where this bird came from. But I just think it's like so cool that like, I've been wondering for like years if I would ever find a banded bush tit and I found one today. It's the first time I ever found one, but it's even, so th this is at Greenlee Preserve, you know, What's that, 700 feet from my house or something like that? But next slide, please. This is an image from my front yard today. Uh, so this is right before you came home from school, Hannah. So um, what we see here is one, two, three, there are at least five bush tits in that image. And well, they're doing something kind of weird. They're just all sitting up straight there. And um, there actually were about 16 bush tits all sitting up straight here. And, why, and you know, bush tits are always moving around. If we could look at the next image, please. So what bush tits do, and I've noticed this before, but I finally got really good photo and especially video documentation of a day. I'm not gonna show you the videos. It was just too hard to put them into a slide here. Um, so bush tits stop as a flock to preen. I've never, I, I bet like babblers in Africa do this too or something like that. But so bush tits are always moving, but when it's time to preen, they all do it together, you know, like little girls go to the bathroom at the same time or something like that. But bush tits all stop to preen at the same time. I, I don't know about this behavior in any other bird. And the flock just stops and they all preen at once. And, you know, think of other really gregarious birds like pelicans or um, gulls or, or, or geese, you know, they kind of just preen when, when they need to, you know, a bird will sort of, excuse me, and kind of go off to the side and just preen. I mean, you'll see that if you see a big enough flock of geese or gulls or pelicans, you know, you'll see some birds preening, but the whole flock stops and does it at once. And that image earlier got it, that the video, which again, I'm not gonna show you all because I couldn't figure out how to put it on PowerPoint. It's so cool because you can see all 15 or 16 of the bush tits all preening at the same time. They start at all the same time. They all preen at the same time. Sometimes they preen each other. Sometimes they preen themselves, but they all do it at the same time and then they stop. And my next and I think final image, is a close up here of a male bush tit preening. I'll notice what it's doing here. It's cleaning off one of its recently erupted retrices. So that tail feather is much shorter than the other ones. It's January. They're not supposed to be growing in new tail feathers in January, except bush tits do it. So here's a bush tit caught in the act. It's a male, by the way. He's cleaning off one of his erupting retrices, something that you know shouldn't happen, as I said, to birds in the month of January. And I just love how 
They're always doing cool stuff. Here's a bush tit, a male of the minimus plumbius subspecies in Colorado, cleaning off its newly growing tail feather. They are, as I said, just constantly amazing. Who knows what I'll discover or rediscover or learn or wonder about tomorrow. But I have to say that every single time I go out and look at bush tits, I learn something new. They are constantly amazing. All right. I'm going to go all the way back to that audience participation from the very, very beginning. Remember I asked you all um, what your favorite bird was and the three adjectives that you would use to describe it. All right. So there was this old pop psychology game from the 1980s that um, it had a lot of traction back then. Some of you all may realize it, but um, or maybe may remember it. But you would be asked questions like, "What's your favorite color? What's your favorite body of water?" And one of them was, "What's your favorite animal?" And what are the attributes you use to describe that animal? And according to the psychologists, that is our own description of ourselves or what we want ourselves to be. So if one of you chose, you know. Um, I don't know, the turkey vulture, because it is uh, resourceful and uh, grotesque and, uh, and sinister. Well, then according to the psychologist, you think that you are grotesque and resourceful and sinister. Or maybe you chose, I don't know, the painted bunting because it is splendiferous and ethereal and glorious. Well, that's how you think of yourself as well. That's why we're not going to do the show of hands thing here. But that bird you chose and the adjective you use to describe it gets at what you think yourself, you are all about. Now, I've been talking about bush tits, and you can already tell I really, really, really like bush tits, but I think I'm speaking on behalf of all of us when I'm saying that the qualities of bush tits, I think, describe all of us in this room. We who are birders, we who are naturalists, I think yeah, it's they're tiny, they're sociable, but that's not really what I'm getting at. They're just always amazing us, always surprising us, always teaching us new things. And I think that that is the the abiding fascination with birds that we can go out and see something amazing. By the way, I, I'm like the only person in Boulder County who has not yet seen a bohemian waxwing, but that's going to end like tomorrow or so. Oh, oh you, just give it a day, Scott. I, th th there were eBird reports today, like in the hundreds within 500 feet of my house. So it's, it's going to happen. Scott, we'll, we'll, we'll get the, the waxwing. But I guess we're, we're, we're going to see a waxwing or we're going to see something completely unexpected a rarity perhaps, or a rare behavior, or we'll see a really familiar bird like the bush tit or a house sparrow and learn something new and cool and amazing. And I think again, that whether your favorite bird was the kingfisher or the vulture or the hummingbird, every one of you, I think, can relate to this idea that you see a hummingbird or a vulture or a kingfisher and you learn new things, you wonder at new things, you marvel at new things. And to me, that is more than anything else what brings us together as birders. And by the way, very much as, as natural historians and as students of the material universe, I think that what I've said could absolutely apply to an audience of insect lovers or amateur astronomers or you know, anybody else who's really into the world around them. So that's a thought that I want to leave you all with. Bush tits are constantly amazing, but birds are constantly amazing and nature is constantly amazing. It's an incredible blessing that every one of us has. Um, I know that it's something that I will carry with me forever. It's also something I feel very strongly, as you can kind of tell, compelled about bringing to everybody else out there. You all have that story to tell as well. Probably not about the bush tit, but about hummingbirds, vultures, bohemian waxwing tomorrow, perhaps. Get out there, share that message. It's wonderful. We're in a church. It's good news. It's good news for everybody. It's something that the world really, really needs to hear. And on that note, I'm going to say good night. Thanks. And we'll do questions, right? Okay. And I just want to make sure that the, the Zoomers get a chance. And again, if you don't mind, if you could figure out who the person is, because I might know the person. Oh, and did, Hannah, do you come up here? Did, does Hannah do questions too? Or? Okay. Okay, so we're going to, so Hannah's going to answer questions about guillemots. I'm going to answer questions about bush tits, and this is going to be the weirdest Q&A of all time. All right. Um, yes. Cool. Yeah, so the, the, the comment, again, for, just for the Zoomers out there, was that, so that's Paula back there, right? Yeah, sorry, masks. It's real. Yeah, name please would be great, but I, I recognize Paula. Uh, her bush tits are incredibly regular and they make the rounds at the same time. Okay, another question. And bush tits are bored because they all are, they're kind of a collective. 
and they oh, all I thought you said Borg. Borg, like another Star Trek got, reference. Got you, right, right on. Because okay. they, uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but they, when they start moving, deciding to move to their next destination, they all decide to go at once. Much like your preening behavior. Yeah. So um, I'm sorry, I, I got distracted. You, you were talking about the fact they all go. They they once they uh, depart from one shrub to another, they all decide. Oh, we all have to go. Yeah. And nothing's going to be so nerdy. They all go, but they all they, they move single file. Yeah, single file. So that reminds yeah. me of what <laughs> character in Star Wars for A New Hope? Sand people always travel single file oh, yeah, to yeah. cover their tracks. Yeah. And I always think of Bush tits. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I know. Claire and Hannah are like, get me out of here as fast as possible. Um, and by the way, remember, Hannah is here. Even if you can't see her, she can answer uh, Gillamot questions too, if there are any of those. I have a question. Yep. Um, I <laughs> I understand that it is the fact that there are no more cattle grazing uh, as much in the foothills anyway. I've heard this theory that the shrubbery has increased. Yeah. So um, you're going back a bit before my time with that one. So the, oh, the question, by the way, was about the um, well changing habitat in the Front Range metro region related to the diminishment of, of agriculture overall. So uh, yeah, there's less agriculture here uh, than there used to be. Um, but I want to be wary of uh, going straight from cause to effect on that one. We're also just, you know, there are millions more people in the front range region than there were, you know, 50 years ago, and they all build houses and they all plant trees. Um, and that would happen with or without uh, cattle grazing. So my guess, and I'm going conjectural here again, I'm really good at that, is that what we're seeing more than anything else is just the um, the addition of literally millions of human beings to the Front Range metro region, you know, going back several decades now, uh, and all those homes and all those plantings and all those suet feeders. I think that's the bigger part. Yeah, I'm actually in Tucson, but I'm, I'm from Denver, and I'm just really curious about the, you know, uh, <clears throat> the bush tit moving further north and whatnot. Um, what evidence have you got from, from climate change? Is there a direct climate change? Yeah, so um, no, um, as I said, it was consistent. It's the, the movement northward is consistent with the warming and drying of the climate. So if you look at, so we have a very, very good record, for example, of um, on average, how much warmer and drier it is year after year after year in Colorado. Um, we can look at these isoclines of uh, temperature and, um, and, and, and precipitation and just watch them sort of creeping northward and bush tits, and by the way, many other birds, uh, black chin hummingbirds leap to mind, for example, uh, are doing likewise. They seem to be moving northward with these northward moving temperature and precipitation isoclines. So it's a, um, it's a strong correlation. Um, it, it fits the model, but, and I'm not sure if you were there for this part of the talk or not. There are other proximate explanations as well, including habitat provisioning, and I think suet feeders as well. So it's consistent with climate change, but, proving a causal link is beyond my pay grade. Yeah, I get that. Uh, so the, uh, the last question you may not understand, um, <clears throat> with the bush tit moving into the habitat in Colorado in general, I guess, um, are they displacing another species that's maybe moving out because of climate change? Uh, good question. Um, as far as I know, the answer is no to that. Um, it's funny, my, my training is actually in academic ecology and I'm gonna betray my 1980s and 1990s roots in here, here. I'm not a fan of the importance of competition and modeling, molding communities in short-term ecological time anyhow. I think that a lot of birds actually don't compete very much. Um, we're not seeing evidence that bush tits are out-competing, let's say chickadees or kinglets or something like that. Um, I will say, even though you didn't answer this question, ask this question at all, that the one a lot of us wonder about is the Eurasian collar dove. So collar doves, which are huge, they're enormous compared to bush tits, um, uh, have I mean, they've taken over there everywhere. You can see hundreds of them in many, many places. And the question is whether or not they are out competing morning doves. And that's an open question. Uh, as far as I'm aware, uh, there's no direct evidence for that yet. I know that Christy Carello and her students at uh, Metro State in Denver are interested in that problem, but um, it's a good question. My guess is no. Um, and I would also say to any person who wants to do research on this, Collar dove and morning dove. That'd be a really, really cool one to look at because collar doves are aggressive. They eat like crazy. They live in the same places that morning doves do. And if you're looking for an example of a bird that might be out competing an indigenous species, I'd go for 
Eurasian collar dove and morning dove? It's an open question. We don't know the answer to it now. Hey, Patrick, okay. I, I see you up there, by the way. <laughs> okay, the last question is for your daughter. Oh, sorry. I, am I supposed to wave here? My bad. Uh, but Patrick, I don't, I, I, I'm like, so not, I have no idea where I am. Like, like you guys are out there in Georgia and I'm kind of here in Colorado and uh, bear with me, man. Sorry. All right. You guys are great. Good seeing you guys. Hey, hey Patrick. <laughs> Patrick's one of our, our birding buds. And I just got to say about Patrick. He gets around like, everywhere. Like, oh, there's Patrick in New Jersey. Oh, there's Patrick in Colorado. There's Patrick in Colorado again. Like if you go birding enough, you'll run into Patrick. All right. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, can I ask the question of your daughter? Yeah. When oh, you were when you were in Maine. Wait, 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 wait. Hang on. <laughs> when you were in Maine and you saw the puffins. Did you have any, any indication, I know you were only in a short period of time, but do you have any indication if the puffin population was increasing or decreasing? Um, that's a really great, great question. Um, and personally, I couldn't observe that. I was literally on the island for one day on Eastern Egg Rock, but we got to talk to the researchers there and then see all the data that had been compiled for the last like 50 years. And the population that has existed on the island has since been established and their numbers are growing. Um, when Eastern Egg Rock was first like founded and established as a puffin conservation island, they actually put like puffin decoys on the island to try to bring puffins in and show them that it was a safe place for them to nest. Um, and there was only a couple nesting pairs for the first like 10 years. And then this was like in the 19, like 70s, so way before my time. But since then, um, the, pu the puffin colony is established there now. And they, I don't know the exact number of breeding pairs they have there each season, but their numbers have definitely increased astronomically since when the island first started out 50, 60 years ago. Very cool, thank you. No problem. This is a question from Elaine, it's gonna be a hard one. I have a question for, for both of you. One is when I first, for Ted, for bush tits, when I first started seeing bush tits in my yard, I started adding mealworms to the suet, but it doesn't seem like it really makes a difference. So I was gonna ask you about that. And then I have a question for Hannah. Actually, Hannah's gonna ask, answer that question, I think. This is a wild <laughs> So my dad kind of alluded to this when he was in his presentation, but basically I'll try to do a very brief story. But um, right now I'm in the IB program at my high school, which is a, kind of like the AP program, which a lot of people are familiar with. But um, for part of the requirement for the IB program for each class, you have to do these things called internal assessments. And it's for my biology class that entails basically an experiment. Um, and for my biology IA, which I'm in the thick of right now, I decided to investigate lipid content in suet and see what um, what different kinds of lipids. So I, I controlled the types of nut butter that was in each suet cage. And then therefore I could control the type of lipid and the like concentration they mount per suet cake. Um, and I wanted to see if there was a specific correlation between feeder birds and what lipids they preferred. Um, and I had some, right now I'm still collecting data, but I've had some very unexpected results. And one of the ingredients that I ended up putting into my suet cakes were mealworms. Um, and what we have discovered over the last week or so is that white crowned sparrows are like, uh, what, I don't know. The, addicted. Yeah. Addicted <laughs> to my suet cakes. Um, they have all lost about, I think 200 grams in weight in four days. The, the cakes, um, not the birds. Yeah, the, the, not the birds, sorry. The cakes, that'd be very concerning. if That would be a very obese white crown sparrow if it was more than 200 grams. But the suet cakes have lost about 200 grams. And so far I have observed zero bush tits at my bird feeder. I, I've been in school for the whole day. So that's part of the problem. But what from what I've observed is that the white crown sparrows are just annihilating and devouring the uh, mealworms and they're uh, yeah they're only formative white crowned sparrows that are coming there's no adult white crowned sparrows at my feeders which is um that was not something that i was anticipating at all in the beginning of the experiment um and i'm continuing to collect data and at the end when i run all my statistical analysis and all that kind of stuff it'll it'll be really interesting to see what happened and then i also a raccoon came in and stole one of my suet cakes so i'm down to four now but it's still interesting. <laughs> 
Well, thanks. I'm gonna have to check that out because I have white crown sparrows on my feeders, yeah. but they don't go to the suet. So but the question I had for you was um, when I was in Maine a few years ago on a job, I stayed to go bird watching and the sounds of the black throated green warblers were just amazing. And I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about some of the bird song that you liked hearing in Maine. Yeah, for sure. Um, I actually, for one, at the last day of Hog Island, we had to like kind of write stories and put them into this like journal. Um, and it was, this is really cool because it, for however long this camp has been going on each year, um, people, uh, campers write in their own memories from the camp. So I could like rifle through the journal and see like entries of young birders that I know, like I remember seeing Johanna Beam had an entry in there and some other bird, I think Patrick might've had an entry in there actually that I read about. <laughs> um, and I wrote my journal entry on the song of the hermit thrush, which we have in Colorado, obviously. And it, I, before I was in Maine, I had never really fully appreciated um, the song when I was out there. And it was really interesting because I, I, like I said, that's a, that's a bird that I'm familiar with in Colorado. And I remember one day we were out in the forest, we were on Hog Island proper and we were um, doing a afternoon hike. And the forests in Maine are so different than the forests that I'm used to in Colorado. They, with, they feel, quieter to me so that when you're in the forest themselves and there's all this moss and you're just listening to kind of like um the trees swaying a little bit in the wind and then out of nowhere this beautiful hermit thrush just started singing it was so haunting it was so quiet and we all kind of just like sat there and listened for like three minutes to this hermit thrush just singing in the wind and then um, a couple minutes later we also heard ospreys which and again another bird i'm very familiar with in colorado but they were just kind of like had these keening cries and they were just flying over the bay and then flying over the forest and it was so special to just like sit there for you know five ten minutes and just listen to the those two birds which again I'm really familiar with but I had never really gotten the time or paid attention I guess to them like that um and then of course there was all the warblers out there that I was completely unfamiliar with like I remember I really liked the Canada warbler song that was something I really liked um I'm trying to remember some of the other ones. Oh, and I, I could show this to you some other time, but um, the turns when you're on Hog Island, I mean, I don't know if that's what you, what you would call beautiful, but um, they're just like squawking constantly. And it's, it's really an experience to be in a seabird colony that close with them flying over your head and just constantly just like cackling and screeching at you. So lots of cool bird songs out there. I have a really quick uh, hermit thrush story, though. Um, uh, years ago, I was leading or bumbling my way through a, a field trip, and like it was, it was like G September or October or something, and a uh, hermit thrush started to sing. I was like, hey, guys, guys, check this out. This is a really unusual behavior. Hermit thrushes are supposed to be done singing. And like somebody was like trying to shut me up. And, and it was Elena, actually, and it was your ringtone. Um, yeah, so, so Elena's ringtone is a hermit thrush, and it totally had me, but I'd like finish this like, you know, soliloquy on how it was, you know, a really notable behavioral exception for a hermit thrush to be singing at time of year, which is true, but it wasn't a hermit thrush at all. We have a question here from Ann Nightingale. Oh, Ann, so we've got, we've got a foreigner here, Ann. How yeah, so you? Uh, well, thank you for being here. Thanks for the presentation from both of you. It was awesome. I, I hope they have an old birders camp at Hog Island. I'd like to go someday. Um, and Ted, uh, I'm here tonight about because bush tits are one of my very favorite birds too. Um, and I'm at the northern extent of the range pretty much, uh, Vancouver Island and south, southeastern British Columbia. And one of the things that we comment a fair amount about here is that in functionally going up, is analogous to going north when birds' ranges change. Do you think that uh, that what you're seeing in Boulder is is the moving upward rather than moving northward, or some kind of combination? Yeah. So, and that conversation actually came up at uh, dinner tonight. And I'm sorry, I, I had dinner with like Karen, Carol, Karen, Carol, and Karen, or something. And, oh, you okay? Sorry, but uh, and um, so you're at 6,600 feet, as I recall, and. Her, 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 uh, sorry, Carol? Karen, I'm sorry, Karen's question was, you know, how come we don't have any bush tits? I was like, yeah, give it 10 years, they'll, they'll be up there um, by then. So yeah, whether you're going up or whether you're going north, um, they're essentially, you know, physiographically sort of the same thing 
uh, for birds. Hey, I want to just really quickly point out, since we've got Anne on the other side of the Sierra Cascade axis, with us, so she's on the, the, the far west coast of North America. So her bush tits are the minimus subspecies, Salter Paris, minimus, minimus. They're like the really, really, really little bush tits. And they're really very different from ours. They don't have that um, darkened auricular at all, but they have this glorious little sort of brown cap. They're, they're really, I hate to say this, but they're really cute. Like our bush tits are kind of cute. Fierce looking, and Anne's bush tits are really kind of cute looking. Cute. So, yeah. Anne, <laughs> sure. thanks so much for coming in. Glad to have an international audience. Great presentation. You. Thank you. Oh, we can keep going all night, right? Now, the church is going to, they have to have, they have church tomorrow. I don't know. We, we, we have to leave eventually, but. Um, well, um, oh, 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 I, I'm sorry. Uh, the, the question was it was the black eared bush tits, or the, and let, let me be cautious here. The bush tits with black ears, as opposed to the black eared bush tits, because the name black eared bush tit refers to a taxon, Salter Paris minimus melanotus from Mexico. So the question is, is it the first time I've seen them here? So no, but this was the most, it was more compelling in 2022 than any previous years. Um, starting about 2019, we were seeing these uh, males, so with the dark eyes, and they looked young because they had that sort of loosely textured plumage. Um, that that's consistent with an idea that our interior, northern interior bush tits subspecies, minimus, uh, sorry, plumbius, um, can, can be dark eared as, as young males. So that's, they're still very striking birds. This year, seeing these adult females with the bright yellow eyes, that like kind of, uh, that takes it to the next level. And by the way, we're just, really going to be looking out for this uh, next year. Oh, by the way, not we. All of us are going to be looking for this next year. So when you see bush tits, like, don't just say, oh, it's a flock of bush tits. Like, take a look at them. See what color their eyes are. See um, whether their uh, auriculars, their ears are dark. Uh, listen to them. Make recordings if possible. I guess look for uh, Oaks banding. Uh, I, that's really cool, by the way. Uh, Oaks bands and other things. So um, it, it's, you know, it's funny. Bush tits can be so I mean, I'll admit it, they're kind of frustrating because like there's 50 or 25 to 50 of them in a flock, 50 in the winter, you know, 20, 25 in the spring. And they're just like buzzing around, you know, just like insects, but try to get on them and you'll see some really pretty amazing stuff. So, sorry, that was a really long answer to your question. We've had them in the past, but like they've been better and we're going to keep watching them. Thanks. I know, but they weren't pushed it 20 years ago there. <laughs> yeah. and, and they're moving farther north and farther east. Um, pr prediction here, I think that um, the next bird for the state of Nebraska is going to be a bush tit. I mean, because, I mean, those shelter belts going out along I-80 or also up 76, um, why not? You know, Scott, we've seen them like east of Lamar, and that's almost in Kansas. So, um, yeah, so those of you who want to... Uh, uh, boost your N Nebraska list and stake your claim to fame in the annals of Nebraska birding. Just hang tight there on the border with Colorado and watch for the bush tits. Oh, oh sorry, Hannah said, be sure to repeat the question. Are there examples of other birds moving northeast? I don't know, do you know the answer? She said, I should answer it. Well, yeah, okay. So the one that seems like a really um, parallel um, like a match with the bush is the black chin hummingbird. Um, their ranges in Colorado 30 or 40 years ago were like almost perfectly coincident. And today they're perfectly coincident and much farther north uh, than they used to be. So black chin hummingbirds, uh, which are highly migratory, unlike bush tits, um, seem to be doing precisely the same thing. In general, birds all across the northern hemisphere are moving farther north. So um, some birds are doing this incredibly slowly, like greater roadrunners, uh, and then other birds like bush tits and black chinned hummingbirds are doing it much more rapidly. Uh, the black Phoebe's doing that, um, and this hummingbird, they'll, they'll be here before too long in Colorado, um, I think. So yeah, actually quite a number of birds are doing it, but for a perfect analog in eastern Boulder County, I'd go with black chinned hummingbird. Yeah, white-winged doves are doing this sort of broad front movement north as well. They do it in a different manner though. Broad wing, uh, um, white wind doves sort of like, they send these pioneers out like that hundreds or even thousands of miles farther north. Like, you know, they show up in Canada and then they don't show up in Canada again. So um, 
it's a very slow and steady northward progression with the bush tits and the uh, black tinned hummingbirds. And it's much jerkier and kind of erratic with the white winged doves. But yes, they're definitely moving north. Uh, any any online questions, uh, Sandra? Uh, uh, I, I, let's do, so the question was about dick sizzles. Um, dick sizzles are the ultimate erratic, irregular, wackadoodle, interannual variation kind of bird. Sometimes we get lots of them and sometimes we don't. It's probably related to precipitation more than anything else. And so there was an internet question. Is there internet? That's it. The, the, that will be yep. the last one. Yeah. No, I think everybody's um, had their questions answered here. So thanks very much.